Thank you for attending this webinar sponsored by NEC Corporation. To learn more about the Programmable Flow Networking Suite featured in these use cases, please contact your NEC account rep today or go to NEC Corporation of America's website at www.necam.com sdn. To find additional SDN, OpenFlow, and Network Function Virtualization resources, visit ipspace.net slash sdn. You know how load balancers work. Effectively, they're mapping an outside IP address to a number of inside IP addresses using whatever algorithm. And effectively, what they have to do is some sort of net. So for every active session, a load balancer needs a net translation record between the outside IP address and the inside IP address. And if you include things like stickiness for every user, then you need the per user state. So in many cases, a load balancer becomes a choke point, which forces you to buy a bigger load balancer. You would love to have a scale out architecture where you would have numerous load balancers, but that is somewhat hard to do because, you know, they all have to share the same outside IP address. And this is somewhat hard to achieve. Now, the problems we have with scale out architectures like this are as follows. You know that if you connect things like this, the ingress switch or the outside switch will do ECMP its way. It will see the same IP address on three boxes, so it will do some sort of ECMP. And then you need some sort of default route going back, so you will have some ECMP here. You could cheat with source net, and that might even work. But if you don't cheat with source net on the load balancer, then there is no guarantee that traffic coming in over this box will not go out over a different box. You could cheat with source net and get around this limitation, but if you don't do that, then it's obvious that these two boxes need to share state. Now let's move to an even worse scenario. Let's say we have three boxes and we cheat with source net, so we've solved the return traffic problem. And now the switch is sending traffic to all three boxes based on five tuples. This box dies, and now the switch has to rehash all these entries, and the switch will start sending these entries to these two boxes, but in a totally different order. The moment a single load balancer in the cluster fails, you will probably get a totally different distribution of flows which means that if you don't share state between these three load balancers, then you will lose all the sessions. I am told that occasionally the switches might just decide to dynamically rehash ECMP entries. So in order for any scale out stateful architecture to work, the devices have to share state. There are two ways to do that. Option number one is that they actually share state which is extremely chatty. So the vendors are trying not to do that. What the vendors are trying to do is if the return traffic lands on the wrong, in double quotes, device, they have an internal interconnect and send the packet to the right device, which then processes the packet. Which means that, of course, you have a lot of traffic going between these boxes, and the more boxes you have, the more traffic goes between them, with the result that the scale-out performance is definitely far, far from being linear. I think I've seen some numbers that even with two boxes, you get only 70% of twice the throughput, in some cases with some vendors. But that doesn't matter. Remember that the performance is not linear. If you have four boxes, you will not get four times the performance. Some academics are trying to solve that problem by saying, well, we'll do flow-based forwarding in the switches. You know, when the first packet comes in, it hits whatever switch, the switch punts the first packet of the flow to the controller, 
the controller will install what is effectively a net entry in this box, and we're done. Yeah, of course, the return traffic might hit the other box, at which point the other box will punt the traffic to the controller. The controller will say, okay, I have this entry well, so let's reinsert another forwarding entry here with reverse net entry so that the return traffic goes to this client. And then if there is a topology change and the traffic starts arriving at this box, yet again, the first packet will be punted to the controller, the controller will install the net entry and so on. You know where this is leading. This doesn't work in practice. You are severely limited by the number of flows in the hardware switches. NEC supports 100,000 flows in their edge switches. Even that is not enough for large-scale load balancer deployments. I have statistics from one of the pretty large websites where they had 400,000 TCP sessions on a single Linux box with two 10 gig ports. You cannot expect to do the same thing with, let's say, 100,000 flows in a switch that has way more bandwidth than just 10 gig. Then, of course, you're severely limited by the bandwidth between the open flow controller and the switches and the flow installation rate, which is orders of magnitude too low today for any reasonable gig or 10 gig environment with, let's say, realistic traffic mix. This is a pure academic exercise that does not work in practice. So what can you do? Well, here's an interesting trick. You could split the traffic between the scale-out load balancer. You still need a scale-out architecture. You still need the load balancers to exchange state. Hopefully, they exchange misrouted traffic because that is easier than exchanging state. And then you install some coarse-grained entries into the edge switch. Let's say you do this based on source IP address or maybe range of source port numbers, but usually you would do this based on the source IP address. So you would say, well, okay, if the traffic is coming from 10.0.0.0 slash 12, send it to the top load balancer. On the other end, you need a matching entry if the traffic is going to 10.0.0.0 slash 12, send it to the top load balancer. You can do that with the open flow controller and it would work nice. But what some load balancing vendors did was they developed a control application that monitors the state of the load balancers and then figures out where the hotspots are through the REST API. It tells the programmable flow controller how it wants the traffic to be forwarded. So you would have a programmable flow controller in simplest case monitoring just a few open flow switches. This open flow switches would be two independent tenants because the load balancer sort of breaks the layer three domain into two separate domains. So you would have tenant one here, you would have tenant two here. And effectively, what the load balancing controller would do, it would tell the open flow controller how to install IP static routes into the open flow switches. And the load balancing controller can dynamically adjust the mix however it sees fit based on the hotspots from which the traffic is coming in. Is the communication link between open flow controller and the load balancer controller bidirectional? Yes, it has to be bidirectional. The load balancer controller would tell the open flow controller what entries to install, and then it would collect the statistics from those entries to figure out how much traffic are actually sent through each individual forwarding entry. How is the traffic redirection happening to the crosslink for flow miss on a load balancer? That has to be handled internally by the load balancers. You need an interconnect network between the load balancers, and this one is just a simple layer two network between the load balancers. And the load balancers, they handle the flow miss themselves. To learn more about the award winning NEC programmable flow networking suite, 
or the complete SDN ecosystem NEC is building with partners, and how you can customize these use cases for your own networking needs. Call your NEC account rep today or go to NEC Corporation of America's website at www.necam.com slash SDN. Thank you for your time and interest in NEC. Additional SDN, OpenFlow, and Network Function Virtualization webinars, recordings, and workshops, as well as other resources like books and case studies, are waiting for you at ipspace.net slash SDN.